je vous invite à, à, à commencer une discussion ou à, à poser des questions, euh, soit en français ou en anglais. The, um, the study? The sa we're finished the sampling. Okay. Um, the sampling is complete. Uh, we are still analyzing those dust samples now for other things like pesticides, flame retardants, um, plasticizers like BPA, bisphenol A. We're going through everything because Health Canada wants to know uh, typical levels. Do uh, air filters really work? You know, those <laughs> you see advertised on TV for hundreds of dollars. Do they really work or not? It's a gimmick, perhaps. The I follow this. I'm not. I don't know as an expert because I haven't tested them myself. But of course, I'm interested in it. Like already. And I, I, my understanding is it's question of questionable value. Mm -hmm. You know. Well, Oric is one brand which is heavily promoted. Yeah. And so it's sort of the Filters, yeah. Really <laughs> I I don't know. I, I, I couldn't evaluate them really. I um, personally, I I don't think so. But it's not a, an official position at all. I, I read it in a little mail some time ago that when it comes to testing your health, if you don't do it for four years, it stops growing. You're kidding me. Yeah, they put that on. <laughs> <laughs> well, we found a, a wide, wide range across the country because we measured the mass of dust that we collected from each mm -hmm. home. And there was a reason for that. We want to, by, by measuring the area and the mass of dust, we can act, and, and we, we tracked how, how long since people had cleaned, mm -hmm. we wanted to calculate a dust loading rate. And it actually came out that we got a, a good average dust loading rate. We're just working on that right now. But um, some of the homes were, had yielded 35 grams of dust, but most homes it was hard to get one gram. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So this is where, when you were asking about w w how far along we've gone, um, with, with such a small quantity, we're sort of guarding it you know, before we do an analysis, because we, we had to use half a gram for the metals. We put it in an acid digest. You know, get it into solution before we put it in that instrument. Where did you, where did you collect the 35 grams? <laughs> Those, that, that's personal information. Okay. <laughs> and even I don't know that. The, uh, that was part of our consent form that we had everybody sign, that they understood that we weren't going to tell stories okay. about them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in your breakdown of the number, then, I know you seem to focus on the 250 parts, etc., and the 90-10 split. Um, I mean, how serious is that? I mean, that's not a regulatory, that doesn't have regulatory meaning. That's just how the data fell out, just to describe it. Um, as far as what we get, we don't know, we don't have a guideline yet. But if people had over 150 parts per million, we said, that's a bit, you know, you've got a source there. That's a, you know, at the time that when we're collecting it, we didn't know how it would look at the end. But um, this is a, a a good starting place for a discussion about if there was a guideline, where would you set it? You know, but definitely, if you have, uh, you know, high elevated and anomalous and children ingest dust and there's various estimates on how much they ingest per day. There's a lot of error around those estimates. Um, 80 milligrams is often used as an average. So you multiply the, that amount of dust that a child swallows per day and add in the concentration. You can easily exceed World Health guidelines by having uh, this not above 975. So it's a it's a really uh, serious source of exposure. Is there exposure by inhalation of dust as well as by by children ingesting it? Yes, but it's a very small fraction of their total intake. The um, if you imagine a pie diagram, of um, the main sources are food, water. In accidental ingestion of dust and, and soil as well, and then breathing air. 
but it's a very, very small per per percentage. One or two percent is the air. Um, that's not necessarily the case with other substances, though, like volatile organic carbon. Um, you've got in the, in the exhibit examples of, of uh, fabric and materials that release volatile organic carbon. So you can actually get breathe in more indoors than outdoors of other substances. But in the case of metals, it's not the air pathway that's, that's the main source. It's, it's the dust, food, what drinking water. The method that we use to collect um, these samples is not the same as people use to collect as asbestos. They, they collect an air sample for asbestos. Mind you, when Michael was looking at the mineralogy, he kept his eye open for asbestos. We didn't find any, but I don't think it's the right approach for looking for asbestos. Surprised at that, yeah. yeah. So there, there will be a continuation of that research that will, in a way, present this kind of like, uh, information about heavy concentration of metals. On the, what would, as it happens, as best of it, of course, it implies a series of policies and regulations. And uh, do you foresee any area of, <coughs> to say, political future intervention on, on that matter? Or um, there, well, there's a couple of, a couple of uh, areas where. It feeds into policy decisions. One is um, when, is, you know, for example, lead. Health Canada came out with a lead reduction strategy. It, it's posted um, on the internet for public comment right now, actually. And um, so, any actions that are taken to reduce consumer exposure to lead, um, this is, this provides evidence that we need to take some action or at least give people guidelines that, you know, about what they're buying and bringing home um, and how to keep dust levels down. So just basic uh, an understanding of how we're exposed. So what's new about the higher levels indoor is we realize consumer products are a source of lead. It's not just being living near a smelter or, you know. So that's one area. The other area that this information is needed is when there are uh, risk assessments done of homes that are located near contaminated sites. Naturally, the, the soil, the contaminated soil gets tracked into the home. And so when risk assessors are, are looking at that, they want to see how bad the situation is, they need to compare it to something. They didn't know if you have elevated arsenic because you're living near an arsenic source, what's elevated? And so this study will say, okay, this is what typical Canadians are exposed to. I'm not, not that it's good or bad, it's just what the rest of us are exposed to. So that if it's incrementally higher at a contaminated site, then in those locations it can be attributed to the exterior source of contamination. So it's basically those two areas. What's the worldwide context for the study? Are there dust studies that have been done in other, um, in other countries, or is this a new approach that you There are, most of the dust studies, there are a number, and there's a growing number in the literature because there's a growing awareness of this as an exposure pathway. Most of the studies that you find are around contaminated sites. Uh, for example, in Belgium, there's some very good house dust studies um, near smelters to see, you know, and, and you can see uh, if you're going closer and closer and closer to the smelter that the concentrations get higher and higher and higher in the house dust. Um, in terms of a baseline, I don't know of another country that's done this yet. Um, in, in terms of a statistically rigorous baseline. The U United States is the only country I know that has 
legal regulatory uh, limits for lead in house dust. They don't use a vacuum method, they use something called a white method, so they look at the micrograms of lead in a square foot uh, in the floor and the windowsill. They're called clearance levels. So there's a lot of information on lead wipes yeah. in the US. Yeah, I remember when I was living in the States, yeah, it was very easy to be able to buy lead wipes and to... Yeah, do a, do a kit. Yeah, yeah. You, you could get a kit for water and for lead, basically, for wipes. Yes, exactly, yeah. Kits like that in Canada? Is that available that we could test in our own homes? Uh, levels? There's, there were, uh, there, there was a study of, of you know you could you could buy lead test kits um, at Home Depot I think. Um, they weren't being recommended by uh, federal government agencies uh, just because there was so many false positives and false negatives that it, it didn't give people a clear answer. But that said, I understand just in the last six months in the United States, there's some commercially available lead test kits that have passed. And uh, I, apparently on the US EPA website, I haven't looked it up yet, I just heard this because it's a great thing if it's, if it's something you can figure out yourself at home you know, to wipe a surface to see if you've got elevated lead. You know, like a litmus test, that kind of thing. So apparently there's two now. The US EPA, you know, gave uh, universities money to do the research and, and do a proper test kit. So hopefully that'll become more common and, and become available in Canada. Well, I guess what's the balance between, I mean, relying on you know, consumers to sample their own houses you know, and sometimes maybe to be falsely scared about yeah. you know, contaminants versus this being a kind of broader public health concern and the government having some, you know, some responsibility. Or I don't know how practical that would be towards, you know. I, I feel that um, the push for increased awareness is the number one, you know, to, to, to make people aware of that lead in dust, first of all, is a source for children, and that keeping dust levels down, you can have very high levels of lead in your paint and live in an old home, but keep the dust levels down so that exposure doesn't occur. And, um, and I, I think that, it, that awareness is the key thing right now. If you were to get into requiring remediation of all the old homes, is that a sensible you know, way to spend resources, I don't know. But just letting people know not to, not to be frightened, as you say, but you know, your, your child is not gonna be exposed to lead unless there's something to pick up and put in their mouths. And the, there's a group called, um, there's, I forget the name, they've been, Healthy Retrofits is a report, a non-government organization produced and they put flyers in family magazines this past year um, to, to, to get that word out about lead and dust as being a source. Presumably, I mean, if you look at your statistics, probably I would say one of the key factors to me when I read that is the renovations. <clears throat> Obviously, if somebody's gone in and disturbed the environment yeah. by renovating and therefore putting dust in the air. Yeah. It is like asbestos, you know, everybody panics about asbestos. Yeah. But as most schools have been sitting on the ceiling for 40 years or 50 years, yeah. probably got 35 coats of paint on it. Yeah. And you're, I think you're doing a worse job by taking the stuff up, you're probably putting more asbestos into the air than just leaving the stuff there. Yeah. You know? uh, yeah, and of course it's it's necessary to, to renovate. The would go down with time after a while if you went to that same house again. 15 years from now, maybe that number will look different. Yeah. The, when that paper came out, an American journalist in Washington had the same reaction you did. And uh, they, they published this uh, article that's uh, 
basically saying that Canadians are unaware of safe methods to remove lead paint. You know, that was their uh, conclusion. I, I didn't see that when I published it. You know, it's funny, somebody else looks at the data and sees what I didn't see. But um, you reminded me of something here. Yes, just to, uh, I agree with what you said and to underscore that, you know, in, in this case, 1969 is the average age of these background that we called background. A third of those um, were, were very old. I forget how old. Be below, below before 1960, anyhow, when lead paint was, you know, very, very common. And that means that now that they're in background, that means those people did renovate properly. You know, this is, I thought this was a good news thing, that, that there were so many homes, old homes, that fell in this category. And, you know, definitely, I mean, if we went to smaller communities where the homes were older, we'd probably have a higher proportion of these anomalous. But um, at least it, it, it gives a, a fairly clear message that you can renovate properly. And again, advice on renovations and how to protect yourself during renovations is available on the Canadian Housing um, and Mortgage Corporation yeah, website. So if you, if you just start searching, you'll find Health Canada and CMHC work together on this to get those messages out. What was CMHC's problem? Hmm? What was, what was CMHC's role in this? They do, uh, they actually do quite a bit of uh, uh, building work. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, they, you know, they're, they, they finance mortgages and so, you know, it, the safety of the home and the, you know, the viability of the building and everything are, are is a concern of theirs. So they're always giving advice to renovators, to, con, you know, home inspectors, you know, mold and all those issues. There's quite a bit of in, in, interesting information from their website. But I think it's because they finance the mortgages, you know. Yeah, I, yes, I, I think that the, our results it would indicate that lead has come right down. You know, we've come a long way in terms of identifying that lead is a problem and not using it. But it's just these homes that were, you know, built since 1980 that have high lead in the dust. It shows us there are some, there's still out there some, some sources that uh, probably are pretty common that uh, gradually will become more aware of. So I don't think it's gone. It's not a thing of the past, but it's greatly reduced. Do res residential areas near the water collect more dust than residential areas further inland? The reason I'm asking is because we moved to Nanzada and it seems to be dust never ending. Yeah. What we found is the greatest dust loading levels appear to occur where there isn't any vegetation around. So whether that's near an ocean or the prairies or whatever, it, I think the amount of vegetation around the home appears to be a big influence. I don't know the answer to that. In this case, I should have mentioned that we only looked at single family dwellings, like, uh, you know, uh, ind individual homes. We didn't look at apartment buildings. But so you, I, uh, but I didn't mean to imply that though from what I answered. It's the, it's the amount of dust 
that gets into the air, the amount of available dust for it penetrating through windows and tracking in is lower if, if the dust is held down by vegetation compared but, to an industrial area, for example. But were you looking at, say, a single story or two story houses? We had both. We, okay. had, we didn't isolate down. Okay, the, for the buildings that had two or more stories, was there more dust collected on the upper or lower levels? We did a whole house sample. Okay. So we can't, um, as I was mentioning it, sometimes it was hard to even get a gram from a whole, whole house. We asked people not to clean for seven okay. days before we came, you know. But that's human nature. People want to clean up. And they'd say, oh, we, we cleaned two days ago. So at that point, we just want an accurate estimate of how many days have gone by so that we could get our dust loading rate. But um, yeah, we needed that whole house sample. That's why we didn't distinguish. But it's a good question. One thing in the pilot studies we looked at was how much metal is in, in different rooms. And house after house had higher lead, nickel, zinc, copper indoors compared to outdoors in this urban background. But which room had higher metal? It was amazing how it varied from house to house. We could not find a pattern where it was always higher in the living room or always higher upstairs. I did bring a slide to show in case somebody asked that. This is one, one uh, example of an old home. And in this house, outside, there was 650 parts per million lead in the garden soil. So in Ontario, the limit for residential soil is 200 ppm. So this is, an, uh, this is some legacy contamination here. But in the living room, the main floor, there was 240 parts per million lead in the dust. So this is kind of what w used to be assumed, that it would be the lead would be tracked in from outdoors, but diluted, OK, inside. But let's not forget to measure the upstairs. There was 14,000 parts per million lead in the upstairs. That's 1.4% lead in house dust. And that was in the children's bedroom and the parents' bedrooms. And uh, so again, what happened, we looked in detail at that dust and we found evidence <coughs> of um, the, these, these zinc compounds and, and Portland cement, gypsum, like the minerals that were in the house dust were all evidence of renovation activity had gone on and loosened up the lead in, the, in, the, in that upstairs environment. Whereas in the, in the living room, uh, the particles were similar to the garden soil. So this brought to light some, a pattern that we started to see in, the, in those homes, and that is people don't always renovate their children's bedrooms first. They often renovate the main floor where the company is coming and visiting, and then leave the children's bedrooms till the children grow up or make their own decisions or whatever. But that's the old paint that's getting left in those upstairs areas. So the, this, the timing of re renovating and where you renovate first in a house was affecting the distribution of metals in the house. So that, that was not an intuitive thing. We did not expect to find that. I'm curious about people's reactions, because you mentioned you know, people like, oh, cleaning up before you came, which is like, <laughs> you know, just that old thing of like, when you hire a cleaning lady, then you always, you know, I remember my parents always cleaning just before. You know. <laughs> yeah. so I, I, the cultural reaction to dust and whether people were embarrassed about the study. I mean, and whether, you know, in my mind, I was thinking, you know, if you had called this a dirt study, yeah. you know, I think people would have been mortified. Right? Yeah. They, wouldn't, they wouldn't have opened their doors to you, maybe, yeah. as much as dust, which is somehow a more innocuous word. I, I think the people who reacted negatively, and I'm sure it was the majority, we sent out letters of invitation and it tried to explain everything. Our acceptance rate was 14%, you know. So I think most people reacted negatively. So it just taught us that we had to send out that many more. We had targeted addresses. We didn't know the names or whatever. We had somebody do this third party so that we, 
we weren't getting this private information about people, but they, uh, the, the letters went out and the first year somebody phoned the police and they wrote to their MP and none of this was good for me as a research scientist at Health Canada, you know. And then I realized I had to put out a website describing what we were doing so that people could look and at the website and see that this is a legitimate study, it's not some crank. So that was me learning from my own mistake. But um, amongst the people that did accept, there were not always, there was not always agreement within the family that, that you know, some people really wanted to find out, you know, really wanted to support the research. And then others in the family weren't that keen on it and thought, it was. Have these individual family informed of the result of their own? Every family was informed of the result. Okay, so every family. Every family, family yeah. Verified or relaxed. Yeah, the the uh, the overwhelm. Yeah, we didn't have a negative reaction. We we well we we want we designed our our um, communication so that it was helpful, educating people. I didn't, you know. I didn't speak directly, it was a consultant that spoke, but I wrote the, uh, the uh, wording and so on. And I, I, I think people, for the most part, were appreciative. So, so they got back like a blog and some excerpt from the person? We, we, gave, we wrote a letter about okay. their situation. Mm -hmm. And in that case, so it seemed that after that, when there were very strange uh, data, you, you went back to identify the causes? Yeah, just, just in the case, we didn't have the resources okay. to go to every house and do a kind of a forensic investigation. And we explained that at the beginning, that people would have to do their own follow-up, just because we didn't have the resources to do that. But in a couple of cases, and one was the solder. Um, we didn't know it was solder. It was, uh, the people didn't believe the results. It just, they were that careful. It just it didn't make sense to them. And so mistakes happen. We thought maybe, Maybe we mixed samples or, you know, but, and we went through everything. There was no evidence that anything was wrong. We had their house, their household vacuum sample. It was very low. So here with the sample we collected was really high and the, their household vacuum sample was very low. Then we found the globules of solder in the, in the reject part. And we took them and looked at them, not just under a microscope, but under a, a super powerful X-ray called a synchrotron, and we saw that lead metal. So they appreciated that. Does lead used in other building materials besides uh, ones that you mentioned? It's besides which? Besides paint and plumbing, you, you talked about. Yeah, well, um, like how about, uh, it's so commonly used, it's, our, it's hard to know that the people, there's no, ingredient list on, on all these household products. We, we, we tried to hunt it down. All I can tell you is it's used as a, as a stabilizer, lead is, and in plastics. And so there, we found organic lead compounds. So I, I suspect that, yes, it's probably used in other materials in the home. What they are, I don't know. But it's not just in the metals, in other words. Like that, uh, the, I understand that the tele that telephone cable, you know, the picture I had there of the, uh, yeah. the t that type of uh, sheathing, yeah. has a lot of lead in it, and and the the curly cute to the old fashioned telephone. Talking about renovations of older buildings, uh, and we found elevated levels, and assuming that it came from the pavement, probably. Yeah. Like if people are cutting bricks, for example, I have no idea if that was very possible. That's something that we can do. Yeah. All we had was the dust. So those samples that we looked at in, in detail, we weren't able to go back to the home and verify. So it was working backwards. And really, it's hard. You know, we found, as far as cutting through bricks, we did find. The, the cement and the other, the, those kinds of particles. But we didn't find evidence that the lead was in the cement. It was just, it appeared to be a pigment that was used over the cement, you know. 
but it, it, it would be hard to really put it back together. You'd have to design a different type of study, I think. Yeah, we, we, in the pilot study, we had, um, I can show you one that we did in detail. This is a renovator, and talk about people needing to protect themselves during renovation. He, this, the, in, this, in this old home, we had the opportunity to, to collect the old layers of paint, and we collected the, uh, the gypsum, or not the gypsum, but the, um, the plaster underneath the paint. In that case, the plaster didn't have lead in it. The old paint, the pre-1965 paint had about 3,000 or higher parts per million. And then the younger paint on top had just a few hundred. So it was a, sort of different layers. But yeah, and this fellow protected the rest of the house. He was renovating a kitchen, but he didn't wear his own mask while he was, while he was doing that renovating. So I think that when you were talking about getting a message out, I think. Yes, in the glazes, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so again, people don't necessarily protect themselves when they're sawing through tile. It's very fine particles. Um, but in this study, we, we had collected the dust before the renovation started and during, and we found exactly the same compound. In this case, the lead paint was uh, sulfate, and we found that lead sulfate in the house dust as well even before the renovation started. In that case, it was probably degraded uh, part paint particles, you know, from paint that needed to be maintained. But it was all over the house. This was in the kitchen, but in the upstairs bedroom, the lead was high in the dust too. If one is renovating a house that has lead paint, is it, is it best to try to remove that layer As long as it's uh, as long as it's stabilized, it can. Apparently, people have, have have indicated that painting over it, and there are products that will stabilize the old paint underneath, uh, works. And if it's peeling in certain areas, if it's peeling, it's going to be an exposure issue. Definitely, if it's peeling, it's going to get into the dust. But uh, again, then again, the. Uh, you know, sanding it and getting rid of the, getting rid of that dust and keeping the dust levels down. If you have a little toddler crawling around, um, as long as there's no dust, they're not going to get it. You know, it's it's they're not going to inhale it or get it in other other ways. So, again, I think the universal advice just has to be that sort of common sense to keep the dust levels down. Your research almost suggests to me that there should be an ingredient list for. I know. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. It was amazing when we got into this. It was a dead end to go at it from the house dust. It, you know, we, we, we found out interesting things, but really you have to start a study differently and take apart a house, I guess, and, and look at all the different things, or look at products that are being sold on, on shelves. Uh, I don't know quite how you would design a study like that. Yeah. It's overwhelming. But yeah, even paints, you know. I know art conservationists that are trying to date paintings, you know, based on a little piece of pigment they collect. They're in the same boat, you know, to try and figure out what the ingredients of the paint were in 1940, and then in order to date a painting. There's no ingredient list for paints. But we know metals are in paints, you know, they're cobalt blue and vanadium yellow, and you know, all, even the names of the paints are all elements. Yeah. Do we have any final questions for Ms. Rasmussen? Do you have any other slides? I was just looking, this is, my, I mentioned Michael before. 
And this is some of the instruments that uh, we have at the university, an X-ray diffractometer and a scanning electron microscope that we're looking at, uh, we're using to look at particles. Um, oh yes, this study, here's an, a couple of examples. This is where we took the house, this dust samples from the anomalous homes. You see in one case it was a 10 year old home with 8,000 parts per million lead in the dust and another nine year old home with over 3,000 parts per million lead. And what the, the term bioaccessibility means, it's, it's solubility. We measure the, how soluble the lead is in, in its stomach acid. Because if it's, if it's coming in a form, for example, lead metal, lead chromate, these are toxic forms of lead, but they're not very soluble. But in this case, this, the lead in the house dust was very soluble. 70% of it dissolves in a child's stomach, so 65%. So this is, this is what we found, is that the homes with the highest lead also had the most soluble forms of lead. So it's available for getting into the child's bloodstream. So this is why we published this, is just to get across the message that we're not off the hook just because we have a, a new home. And then I was going to just make the point, I think that's it for the extra slides that I had, but this row here, this is the percent bioaccessibility or, or solubility in the, in the child's stomach. So again, you can see the background homes, the, it's about 60%, 61% soluble. The rest passes through the child, you know, doesn't, wouldn't be taken up. But in the anomalous homes, 81% on average was, was soluble. So not only are these homes containing more lead, but it's more it's in forms that are, are available for being taken up into the body. How does that compare to the lead that's in toilets? Um, the lead that's in toys, it, well, it depends. If, if, it's, if it's vinyl or encased in, in plastic or if it's got, um, or if it's, so, or, or uh, what's the word? Um, I've forgotten, but you know, the, the solid lead metal, what's the word? It'll come to me in a minute. Um, it's not as soluble, but, the, it's, but it tastes sweet. And children, there, there was a case in Calgary, and fortunately the dad in the family was a metallurgist. Uh, they had bought a, a, neck, a lead necklace in a dollar store, um, and they, they didn't know it was lead and the little girl was sucking on it day after day after day. You know, kids do that, they take, put hair in their mouths or they... And, um, but, but that's, that's in hindsight, her behavior started changing. It's a neurotoxin and, and, and so it, the first thing is you start getting upset stomach and so on, but then it, it starts translating into a behavior disorder. So this little girl was, was really uh, becoming a, a behavior problem and her parents took her to the, uh, to the doctor and finally they found out she had elevated lead. And thanks to the dad being a metallurgist, he kind of put two and two together. But that doesn't always happen, you know. People don't always figure out. But this is not necessarily a soluble form of lead. It's just the amount of time she spent sucking on it. Yeah. It became soluble. Anyhow, she, she ended up being all right, but it takes a, a long time to get over that. So this is the importing of uh, uh, pewter, that's the word I was looking. Pewter, pewter is used for, um, you know, the little army soldiers, those little heavy army soldiers. It's used to make tin cans in dollhouses, you know, the, oh, those little tiny things that, you know, they're, it's heavy so it works well for furniture and that type of thing. But kids swallow it, sits in the stomach and dissolves. So no, longer use it. no, not in not in this country, but other countries uh, still, still export it, and and it gets in slips through the cracks. Hmm. Hopefully not in.
Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Pat. Oh, thank you for your interest. Thank you for having me.